The Native American people have long preserved their history, their rituals, and their native language through their music. What does it sound like? What influences have inspired it? Let's begin this discussion with North America. You're listening to Music Student 101. Here are your hosts, Jeremy Burns and Matthew Scott Phillips. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Welcome back. Hey, um... How about that opening track, Matt? How about that? That was interesting. That was a that was a departure from our usual opening tracks. This was very this was kind of difficult for me to do because of being the sound snob I am, I always <laughs> like to have good clean audio, you know. Which that was not, but there's a reason. We're going to give them a little grace though because uh, <laughs> what you just heard was actually the song of salutation by a Passamaquoddy tribe out of Maine. Okay. And this recording was done in 1890. Wow. 1890. 1890. On wax cylinder. Wow. By uh, James Walter Fuchs. Wow. So um, thanks to the recent invention of recording. Yes. Back then, we can finally get some idea. This is the actual the, the indigenous tribe themselves. Yeah. Um, so we hope you enjoyed that, and there might, we'll have a little bit more later on. Indeed. But um, we decided, you know, th- this whole genres idea... You know, yeah. we, we've done an episode on blues. Yes. We've done some episodes on women in music. Yes. We've covered uh, the earlier periods of music and mean to cover more. But the idea of genres, I really like that. Yeah. And we recently heard, um, or we're getting more into them anyways, getting yeah, into yeah. more of them. Recent listeners have been asking about it anyways, so yeah, here we are. Here we are, talking about different things, a little bit outside of... Sort of our Western classical and popular traditions. Yes, yes. And it's it's very difficult to... Um, it's, there's going to be a little bit of speculation going on here. A lot of speculation. <laughs> and speaking of speculation, a good um, a good precursor to this would be episode 33, The Dawn of Music. And, oh, yeah, yeah. Plenty of speculation in that one, Plenty too. Plenty of speculation in that one, but too. But we kind of <laughs> talked about how people came to... to how music came about, you know, or and, yeah, the theories yeah. on how they came about, you know. Right, yeah. Um, with a little bit of history, uh, prehistoric history <laughs> as well. So anyways, that's our episode today. We're going to talk about Native American music. Yay. And um, before we get into that, let's uh, have a little social moment, shall we? Less indeed. So no new reviews. No new reviews, which hopefully just means some of you people will go out there and uh, do some reviews for us. And do some, yeah, and do some reviews and... You know, uh, get us headed back towards the top of the charts, which helps other people find us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But anyways, we have a new Patreon patron to talk about today. We do. We have a new Patreon patron, Fred Lancia. And uh, Fred hails from Sammamish, Sammamish, Washington. Sammamish. Which is near Seattle. Okay. But it's fun to say Sammamish. Sammamish. Uh, he found us back in 2022, and as a kid, he played trombone in the orchestra. Mm. In his junior high school, but he wasn't much into it, and you know he he kind of left that behind, right? But uh, he maintained his love for music. Nice. Fast forward to 2017, Matt. Okay. And uh, Fred says, "I was listening to some old blues music, then bluegrass music, and discovered the music of Chris Stapleton, who is a, a country artist. Mm-hmm. For those of you who may not be familiar, mm-hmm. uh, I'm just proud of myself because I am. So there you go." <laughs> For some crazy reason, Chris Stapleton's music inspired me to try to write some songs of my own. I had never written two lines that rhymed and hadn't played an instrument in more than 40 years. Mm -hmm. I decided I should start with the basics. I completed the online course Getting Started with Music Theory, uh, taught by Bruce Taggart, professor at Michigan State University. And that was a Coursera course, he says? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. Then I completed another online Coursera course, songwriting, writing the lyrics. Hmm. 
taught by Pat Patterson, professor at Berkeley College of Music. I also read The Complete Idiot's Guide to Music Theory. I need that. <laughs> Me too. Uh, by Michael Miller. I learned a lot from these sources and started trying to write music, mostly focused on lyrics. But... Your podcast has really helped me put all of this together. I'm now creating music note by note using Finale music notation software. Mm. I still don't play an instrument, and my singing is probably a small notch above horrible. <laughs> <laughs> when I complete the lyrics and music, I send my songs to professional music studios in Nashville to create demos. I'm really enjoying the process and result. And I want to say that uh, he sent me some of these and we're really excited about episode 130, Listener Compositions. Oh, yeah, yeah, which is upcoming. Because that's going to be on there. And really, I mean, this doesn't sound like someone who just took a few courses. Oh, yeah. This is, I mean, obviously, the Nashville musicians polish it and make it really well. Yeah, the production yeah. value is second to none. The singers are great. Everything is great. But the songwriting is really fantastic. Awesome. I can't wait to and hear it. And the chords it. he uses and the melodies, it's, a, it's great yeah. stuff. So we're looking forward to that. Excellent. Now, Fred had an idea he, he wanted to share with us, Matt. He did. He said, a suggestion. I know you periodically comment about how certain chords or chord progressions are used in jazz or rock or other genres. Mm. And I see that you have a couple of episodes focused on blues. Haven't gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. I suspect many of your listeners can hear a song and say that's a pop song or that's rock or that's R&B or that's reggae or that's disco or that's EDM, that's gospel, <laughs> etc. so on. I realize that there is now significant overlap and fusion between various genres, but I think it would be valuable if you had an episode or episodes that explains what makes a specific song sound like a specific genre. For example, maybe it's the chord progressions, maybe it's the tempo, uh, maybe it's the instruments used, maybe it's the singing style, maybe it's the harmonic intervals. Uh, thank you so much for your continued investment in creating this excellent podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Fred, uh, for your support and for all the wonderful music you're making. Yeah. Um, you know, the answer to his question is yes. Yes to all of those. Yes, yeah. it's, it's the chord progressions, right? Yes, it's the vocal style. Yes, it's the instruments used. Just yes, 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 yes. Right? Yeah, you got it, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's really kind of a fun thing to sort of... Maybe we could dive into, you know, maybe genre by genre a little bit, uh, uh, what makes specific things sound specific ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because uh, it, it, it is definitely uh, something that's sort of a combination of all those things. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we made like a ska version of a metal song the last time we were jamming with a couple of our friends that, that comes to mind. Okay. You know, um, I'd call that fusion. Call that fusion, right? But you know, what we did is essentially change the rhythm to a ska rhythm, right? And mm -hmm. change the vocal style to a ska, more of a ska style. And mm -cha, mm -cha, mm -cha, yeah, mm -cha, right, yeah. And and, like and then all of a sudden we were the mighty mighty boss tones, and it was it was great. <laughs> um, but, but so yeah, it, it, it what makes a specific a specific genre a genre is is a is a correlation really of all of those things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it could be something interesting to get into. Maybe we will. Maybe we will sooner than later. Indeed. <laughs> so uh, Fred is a Patreon patron, and Excellent. you can be like Fred and join us on patreon.com slash musicstudent101. Yes. When you get on the site, you'll see the different tiers. Uh, there's really three main ones. Uh, the $1 to $2 donators. Yes. Uh, and this is like a monthly subscription kind of thing. Yes. And those $1 to $2 donators get... <laughs> Uh, access to a whole bunch of extra stuff. Yes, uh, all the bonus episodes that we have mm -hmm. and uh, some extra videos and some other cool little things that we put up there that you don't get on the regular podcast. Correct. And um, the $3 to $4 members can get like a coffee mug. All those get things an plus awesome the... little coffee mug with Music Student 101 on it. Uh-huh. Very stylish. My, my design, by the way, that's my piano in that picture. Yeah, yeah. Our, our, our logo for all these years now. Uh-huh, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then the uh, $5 plus members can get, um, they can ask us to write like a special episode for them. They can ask us any question. We'll try yeah. and do 15 minutes at least on the episode. No less than 15 minutes answering your music theory question specifically. Which many times will go to the Patreon site, but sometimes it's broad enough to actually become a true episode. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that, that has happened. Mm -hmm. So check us out on Patreon. And uh, thanks again, Fred, for, for doing that. Indeed. Thanks, Fred. And uh, finally, we have a listener mail. Listener mail. Yes, we have Alex Thompson from Denver, Colorado, and uh, Alex brings up a topic that is actually 
appropriate for this episode. So uh, let's uh, let's hear what Alex has. So to say. Alex says. I really liked your podcast episodes on the history of blues. Hmm. I was wondering if you could do something on the history of Native American music to present day. It's something that is not shown, but I believe is out there. It's an important part of our history as Americans, I think. In addition, bluegrass history and Cajun music could be cool. Thanks so much. I learned so much from the theory. The history really inspires me and helps me be more creative when creating my own music. Hmm. Well, thank you very much, Alex. And you are in luck because <laughs> we, uh, we will talk a little bit about um, Native American music uh, from traditional music to its, uh, up to its relatively modern iterations in, in today's a, uh, age. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it, is, it is definitely out there and it's definitely uh, something worth talking about. And um, this is one of my favorite kinds of music. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. And uh, uh, Alex is right. Having tried to research for this episode, there's not as much information as I would have liked. Um, right. You got to do a little more digging than, say, for a blues episode. Yeah. Well, you get more information than you can fit into exactly. an episode. Now, yeah. here's, here's a fun fact. Now, Alex, both Alex and Fred had contacted me within a two-week period. Mm. Recently. With the same general suggestion. They both brought up the blues episode. <laughs> one hadn't heard it, but was excited. One had and was excited. <sighs> and uh, they both mentioned genres, you know? <sighs> Mm-hmm. Alex more specifically mentioning Native American music. So yeah. I do like to go, I do like to, when I'm, when I'm doing these genres, I like to start off with something, more of a chronological order, you know? Yeah. Wouldn't just go right into death metal. We could, but- <laughs> We um, could, but yeah. That's not my style. <laughs> <laughs> because we can also learn things about the evolution of music as we go. Absolutely. And uh, that's what we're going to do today. I have a feeling that this is going to be a two-part episode, but we'll see. We, sh- we shall see. We'll see. We'll see how far we get. So let's get into it then, shall we? Okay. Um, as I mentioned, one good precursor to this episode would be episode 33 of the Dawn of Music. The Dawn of Music. Before we get into the music, let's have a moment to understand the origins of the Native Americans. Okay. And I should point out that uh, the Native American cultures span both North and South America, but on this episode, we're just going to focus on North America, the regions that are Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Yes. And when we refer to said countries, we're referring specifically to the regions they now occupy. Right. Right. Okay. So thanks to fossil and DNA evidence, we have learned that all of our ancestors initially came out of Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm talking about Lucy. You remember Lucy? Yeah, Lucy, the, the oldest human skeleton ever found. Was, was Lucy human? Uh, bi- 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 bipedal. bipedal. Okay. Bipedal. Yeah, yeah. Either way, yeah, that was in Ethiopia, and that was right. 3.2 million years ago. Mm-hmm. So we've been around for a minute. Um, our evolution process actually took over six million years. Two million years ago, we started walking upright. Homo erectus. That was, that, that was a banner day. Uh huh. And then about a million years ago, we created fire, which I would argue bolstered community. Mm-hmm. Uh, about three hundred thousand years ago, well, discovered fire. I mean, fire already existed. You know, we, <laughs> Fair enough. Learned how to make fire. We learned how to create and control fire. Exactly. But we digress. We digress. <laughs> uh, so anyways, about 300,000 years ago, we started using our brains a bit more for things like making tools and weapons. You right. Know? Which is, then this was the dawn of the Homo sapiens. Right. Which is what we are now. Correct. We, I guess we haven't evolved to a new, new thing. Not yet. We'll give it a minute. We've got mean, smartphones. Yeah. <laughs> We've got smartphones. But sometimes I'm pretty sure that's <laughs> the extent of our evolution. Uh, homo distracted. Homo distracted. And then about 60,000 to 30,000 years ago is when we took interest in art. Now, I say that there were cave paintings. Sure. Which also had not not always were for the purpose of art, you know, but they were using art to create them, you know. And some of them might have been just for the purpose of creating art, you know. Mm. And as we've also learned, uh, one of the oldest instruments discovered dates back to 30,000. 35,000 years ago. We talked about that in episode 33. Indeed. That was in the Holofeld case in Germany. (laughs) <laughs> the bones of a griffin vulture had been made into a flute. Right. But apparently um, there was also a Neanderthal flute discovered in Slovenia that dates back to 50,000 years ago. Oh, nice. So suffice it to say that by this time, our ancestors were A, far away from our African stomping grounds, mm-hmm. and B, had discovered some form of music. Right. Or created some form of music. Yeah. Developed, however you want to look at it. Okay, moving forward, 20 to 30,000 years ago, hunter-gatherers made their journey from Eurasia via the Bering Land Bridge mm-hmm. to North America. We all learned this in, in elementary school, or yeah. I did anyway. Yeah, this was the land bridge that connected Siberia to Alaska during our most recent ice age. 
Correct. So genetic evidence shows that uh, these now Native Americans traveled back and forth over this land bridge until it sunk underwater about 12,000 years ago when mm-hmm. that ice age, ice age ended. Yeah. So is it fair? It's only 12,000 years ago? Only wow. 12,000 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And is it fair for me to speculate, Matt, that by the time these tribes settled in America, they are already kind of a melting pot from many different regions and cultures? Probably. Yeah. Um, these people had this continent pretty much to themselves until about 1492 in the United States. Correct. 1519 in Mexico hmm. and 1535 in Canada. Yeah. By 1530, only a decade after Hernan Cortez set foot in Mexico, the indigenous people were already being taught European music. Mm. Especially what kind of music probably, Matt? Probably European classical music, if I had to guess. Oh, I was going to say church music. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. That's a better guess. Probably a little bit of both, huh? <laughs> that's probably a better guess. It was probably mostly church music. Because the Crusades weren't long after this. Right. And it was always all about spreading the faith. Mm. Uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Uh, gold, God, and glory is is why the the Spanish conquistadors came to. Seems like I remember that from elementary school too. Okay, uh, where yeah. Cortez and Pizarro and De Soto and Balboa and Rocky. Yeah, I know there was a, there was a uh, explorer named Balboa. How about that? Well, he landed in this thinnest part of Central America and decided that the New World was just this thin strip of land because that's all he he saw and was very wrong. Well, speaking of down south in Mexico, um, way down south in Mexico, the Mayan culture adopted some of these instruments from the and genres from Spain mm-hmm. that are no longer existing in Spain, right? But still exist within the Mayan tribes. Yeah, so they're very good at preserving the music uh, through tradition and through history and or, or oral or right, yeah, sure, through the music. I would say. Um, and then the Spanish also taught the Pueblo people of the South. West United States, the Matachines. Wow. Have you heard of this? No. It's a dance and it's accompanied by violin and guitar. So they're teaching them stringed instruments. Yeah. And these kind of dance styles. The Pueblo people would later use these moves and similar ones in their own ceremonies. So, uh, and then meanwhile, influ- similar influences were occurring up north via the French in Canada and the British in the United States. Mm hmm. Now, having mentioned uh, the influence of the colonizers, it should be said that the oldest instrument found in in North America was a turtle shell rattle that dates back to the Archaic period, circa 8,000 to 1,000 BCE. Mm -hmm. So, and this was in Tennessee. I remember hearing about the turtle shell rattle. Again, long before the colonizers ever showed up. So, you know, um, there are some articles that were suggesting that African-Americans through the colonizers, mm-hmm. were able to bring drums to the indigenous people. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I'm going to say the drums were around long before that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's, yeah. And if it did come from Africa, it came from the original Africa. It came from right. the people that spread out from there, because that seems to be a pretty constant among most cultures, some form of percussion and rhythm, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah anyways, uh, today there are hundreds of Native American communities on this continent, each with their own culture, cuisine, language, and rituals. But at the heart of all these communities is dance and music. Mm -hmm. Uh, I could speculate. I'm going to get on my high horse again and speculate that without music, would we really have dance? Or without dance, would we really have music? Well, that's a good point, too. I'm going to go with the former. Yeah. But I'm not going to... The two are... There are lots of cultures in the world where the two aren't even considered two different things. Have you seen the video, the YouTube video, where it's like uh, dancing in the streets with Mick Jagger and David Bowie? Mm, Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But there's no music, just the shuffling of their feet and the utterances of their voices. Yeah. Y'all go check that out. Very, very strange. (laughs) They're making that the video, right? Is for um, dancing in for the song "Dancing in the Streets." Exactly. They They took the original footage and and folded in some hilarious foot shuffles. (laughs) It's kind of silly, but no. There, as I say this, there are some tribes that have dance and vocal pieces that have no drum accompaniment. So there goes that theory. (laughs) I got all the theories. Okay. Anyways, um, from tribe to tribe. There are some elements that remain fairly consistent within the music. Yeah. And so we're going to talk a little bit about these, and, and Matt, jump in wherever you can. Okay. Um, the three main ones are percussion, vocal, mm. and stringed and wind instruments. To which I would probably add repetition. Repetition. 
So the so the 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 three sort of defining factors of Native American music are its particular type of melody, which I feel like we're probably about to talk about, mm-hmm. and um, uh, a timbre that leans heavily on organic percussion. So they will, you know, um, percussion instruments made out of things like turtle shells or wood or bark or clay or, or whatever. Was, Animal skins. Uh, yeah, right. You know, the, the things that, that were in the environment. Mm-hmm. And the idea of repeated phrases. Yeah. And I don't mean repeated once either. I mean, you know, significant repetition of, uh, of phrases. Mm-hmm. These drums often keep a steady rhythm for singers and their dancers. Mm. As we said, dance is a huge part of this culture, like most. Very huge. And a very cool thing to watch, by the way, if you haven't seen it. It's very, oh, yeah. very pulsing, very energetic. Yeah. W- one thing you can check out, because uh-huh. um, there's there's all kinds of uh, videos of this kind of thing on, on YouTube, definitely go check it out, is uh, the Sioux Grass Dance. Okay. Sioux, S-I-U-X, mm-hmm. S-I-O-U-X, sorry. Yeah. Um, the Sioux Grass Dance, and the idea behind, or the original idea behind the Sioux Grass Dance was that is this is the Sioux would move into a community um, rather than uh, mow the grass down to make uh, room for their uh, encampment. Hmm. They would they would uh, dance this dance and sing the accompanying music, mm-hmm. and in so doing, dance the grass flat. Oh, cool! So that when they left. In a little over time, the grass would straighten back up, right, and they would have left no, uh, no permanent mark on the land mm-hmm. as, as, that they had moved through. Interesting. Yeah, and but um, you know nowadays, uh, Sioux grass dances happen at, at, at festivals and powwows and places where you can go see it live if you, if you really want to. And there's also videos on uh, YouTube. Um, they feature uh, they feature men in the center of a circle. Mm-hmm. The men are usually very elaborately dressed, yeah, and are dancing in this uh, in this uh, very kind of show offy way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and it's kind of a it's kind of meant to show their prowess as warriors to try to get the women interested in them. You know, peacocking as peacocking they call it. a little bit. Yeah, uh, uh, dancing very aggressively and acrobatically and agilely. Uh, while the women uh, dance in a circle around them in a, in a much more demure, uh, uh, reserved kind of kind of fashion, but it's, it's a little bit of a of a, um, uh, uh, a ceremonial thing even to this day. And and um, the music that accompanies it is is percussion and, and chants, mm-hmm. and a particular a particular chant. There is a particular chant that is the grass dance chant. Yeah, yeah, that, that you will hear. Yeah. Different songs and different have different purposes, and yeah, and they use the same kind of song for much like we kind of do in our churches. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much, yeah, yeah. This is this is basically like Kyrie, yeah, except you know, different, different culture. So, in some cases, uh, a steady beat will gradually build in tempo and embellishment, such as a uh, tremolo. Mm-hmm. Uh, would you like to hear a shaker tremolo? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I have a shaker here, I have a cotto shaker. Uh. Maybe, maybe we're doing this for a second. And then we go. Oh yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's a, a, a huge factor, actually. At the the end of, of phrases or particular parts, especially in things like you know the Navajo have a have a Yebekikai, a song to the gods. It's part of their nightway ceremony, hmm. and you know they'll they'll chant for a little while and then um, do that do that tremolo um, at the end, either either as a a, a call to the uh, to the uh, spirit that they're dancing to or or, or in celebration uh, it's, nice. it's yeah well you know to the native americans when you're beating on a drum you're not just beating on a drum no oh no 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 you're communicating with your people and connecting with the spiritual world mm-hmm. um, they compare the drum to the human heartbeat which indeed. they compare to the heartbeat of mother earth indeed which is part of native american spirituality right the idea that we came from the earth yeah and and are and remain a part of it and I love the importance on rhythm. Uh, isn't everything rhythm? Pretty, Pretty much. much. Matt, <laughs> from the ages to the seasons to the days to the hours and seconds within. Pretty much. All is rhythm. Pretty much. Um, anyway, we... And to here. understand rhythm is to understand music. Definitely. I would say that. The drums themselves were uh, typically single and double-headed, as well as kettle drums, which kettle drum 
just a big old drum that you beat on with, the, with yeah. a big stick. Sometimes yeah. multi pe multiple people beating on the same drum. Yeah. In addition, there are also rattles and shakers made from various things, as we discussed. They're a very sure. resourceful bunch. Oh, yeah. Many tribes would have a drum keeper for each drum. Yeah, really? So, this I is interesting this. to me. Yeah. Usually the eldest son of a selected family, and it was their honored position to maintain the drum and ensure that it was played with proper amount of respect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that brings us to song. Yeah. The next element we're going to be discussing. Um, now, the songs are usually in their native languages. Usually. Or are non-lexical. Non-lexical, meaning that they are not necessarily vocalizations that correspond to a particular word in a particular language. Exactly. Often syllables with no real literal meaning other, yeah. than, other than to induce perhaps a trancing state. What some ethnomusicologists will call vocables. Vocables, huh? And, and just because these vocables are non-lexical, meaning they don't translate to a word, does not mean that they are without meaning. There are vocables uh, that are specific to specific songs, to specific chants, to specific ceremonies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mentioned earlier the Yebekikai. Mm -hmm. uh, these, are, these are songs that are part of the Navajo Nightway ceremony, and they're songs sung to the spirits of, their, of the world. And uh, they feature specific vocables, non-lexical. They don't translate to words, but there are specific sounds that are associated with these songs. Mm -hmm. So the um, a, a, a Navajo person would recognize the song as a yay, as, as a song sung to a spirit, mm -hmm. um, by virtue of the fact that it was it included the vocables designed for that purpose. Mm -hmm. So merely being non-lexical does not mean they are without meaning. Uh huh. Especially to the to the Native Americans. Maybe I should have said without direct translation. Without direct translation. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. Non-lexical means there's there's no there's there's no word attached to it. You know. Non-lexical vocals. Vocables. Yeah, vocables. Yeah. We're sounding it, smart today, man. Woo! Yeah. It's a little bit like in you know in in pop music, like in rock and roll and stuff. Somebody will say yeah yeah yeah. You know that that's not meant. Yeah. To be translated, that's, that's not that doesn't have a lexical meaning, right? He's not saying a sentence. He's not agreeing with you or anything. You know, it, it, it's just sort of a, a, a utterance. Oh yeah, some of my favorite choruses have done nothing but oohs and ahs and la la. Oohs la's. and ahs, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ooh, ah, right. Totally. That's not a word. No. <laughs> um, it's an expression. It can be mm -hmm. an expression. Yeah. Um. So, anyways. Back to some of these elements, you know, um, the mel the melodies themselves are pretty straightforward, pretty simple, typically. Fairly simple, fairly straightforward. Usually pentatonic, or derived, Roughly or pentatonic. derived from the pentatonic scale. Roughly pentatonic, yeah. Now, this is also through the European lens, or th through the European ear, right? Yeah, yeah I was going to say, so, you know, when we talk about the 12 notes of, of the Western chromatic scale, which came from Europe... And even, you know, and the pentatonic scale exists in just about every culture in the world. It's actually kind of freaky and, and, and fascinating to, to start to think about mm. um, um, what a natural occurrence that seems to be. But even when we talk about the pentatonic scale as in these five notes that are derived, you know, that are the, you know, that are the five notes that we Westerners think of as pentatonic, that is definitely through a, through a Euro-America lens, mm -hmm. right? Um the Native Americans who were first creating these chants had no idea what the pentatonic scale was. Yeah, they just... And they didn't really feel particularly attached to um, uh, the the idea of specific frequencies representing specific notes. That's kind of a European, mm -hmm. not entirely European, but it's more of a European thing than, than what Native Americans do, who tend to vocalize in a way that more approximates speech. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, You'll have you know these slides at the end of phrases, mm -hmm. right? And you'll have the this uh, falsetto singing, which is a big part of their their vocal practice. Um, and, and and you'll have uh, the sort of almost unpitched uh, repetitions and vocalizations that that are that are not quote unquote song, you know, uh, sung notes the way we have. Mm -hmm. But those do tend to. Correspond roughly to the pentatonic scale, yeah, or other th or other three note combination, three to five note combinations. Yeah, they. We'll, we'll talk about the triatonic scale in just a second, but real quick, why don't you give us the uh, like the major pentatonic scale with the scale degrees, if you will? So, um, one, 
Scale degrees. One, mm -hmm. two, four, five, six. Okay. Yeah. And then the minor pentatonic scale? Uh, it is one, three, four, five, flat seven. Yeah. And actually, you mentioned the 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 intro music we were listening to. Mm. We were we were identifying a few minor thirds in there. So I wonder. Yeah. So, so you know, so like when we one three five, flat seven. Yeah. You know, kind of kind of deal. But again, not those exact notes. They're not singing the way an opera singer would, right? You know. Yeah, and again, simple me melodies. Uh, the tritonic scale is basically any three notes, really. Could be any three notes, and there's 220 ways to transverse the octave within three steps. And so we're not going to go through all of those, but just know nope. that a tritonic scale is a three note scale. It's a three note scale. Mm -hmm. But if I had to guess, I would say that a lot of these earlier ones through the Western years, yeah, would have been based on the pentatonic scale, probably. Yeah, and again, it is, is it is kind of amazing to study musics of other cultures and start to recognize how often the pentatonic scale comes up mm -hmm. as just this kind of natural sort of phenomenon that cultures that are very disparate from each other uh, tend to develop as part of their musical lexicon. It's uh, it's a little scary. Makes you wonder, well, how does that happen? You know, because it doesn't seem to be like any kind of five note scale diaspora, right? It doesn't seem to be like people are carrying it from one culture to the next. Yeah. So how do how does all of these different cultures come up with the same idea? Uh, maybe it came out of Africa too. <laughs> maybe, perhaps. Uh, you know, that, that's all, spread out where everything else. Spread that's out. a lot of spreading. <laughs> that is sure. Had to start somewhere. <laughs> Anyways, let's talk more about their singing. Actually, okay. And jump in where you can, Matt. But um, okay, we're talking about the vocal timbres. You know, they they, yeah. they vary in coloration from thin and nasal to relaxed and deep. Indeed. You mentioned falsetto was common among the male vocalists, right? Indeed. Um, as well as other techniques such as vibrato mm -hmm. and other movements of the larynx, jaw, tongue, and lips to create sounds that are atypical from regular singing or speech. Uh, uh, from Western singing or speech. It's very typical for them. Well, also they often <laughs> mimic other sounds in nature. Uh, like yeah. Birds, yeah, yeah, yeah. wolves, animal sounds, you know, which I would call atypical from normal speech patterns. Okay. <laughs> uh, atypical from Western singing patterns. Certainly. Certainly. So um, another cool thing is, you know, throat singing is often credited to the Inuit people of uh, oh, yeah. Alaska and Canada. Right, right, yeah. Right? But oh, that stuff's amazing. Have you ever... Like, oh, I've heard it. It's very strange. Yeah. You're, you're basically able to produce two tones at the least, you know, with, yeah, with one the, vocal, set of vocals. Yeah, there's a multitude of different throat singing traditions in the world. That, and that's one of the more famous and famous ones. And yeah. Another and, thing to go look up. Go look up Inuit throat singing. You'll be glad you did. And when he says multitudes, we're talking Russia, Mongolia, Japan, South mm. Africa, China, Italy, and India all have some form of throat singing mm. or did at some point. I doubt that's an exhaustive list, frankly. Right, yeah. In northern Alaska and Canada, this style of uh, song began as an activity for the women of the tribe to entertain each other while their male counterparts were out hunting. <laughs> Makes sense. So two women would face each other using their throat, diaphragm, and belly to create sounds and rhythms and they would try and match these sounds and rhythms until one of them goes silent or starts laughing. <laughs> so it's kind of like a sonic staring contest. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. All right, so um, there's rhythm, there's drums, there's uh, vocals. Other instruments that were often involved were uh, wind instruments, such as flutes and whistles, mm -hmm. and other breath-based instruments. Right. Also, uh, stringed instruments, such as guitars, violins, and musical bows. You know? Yeah, I would think that's a, a later post uh, post encounter with the West kind of development. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, in modern day Native American music, certainly in, in the traditional Native American music, I was taught that string instruments were fairly rare. Yeah, um, especially when it comes to the guitar. Many of these instruments were introduced to these tribes via the colonization of other European cultures. Right. Between the 1500s and the 1700s. Yeah. And we mentioned the guitar that uh, had its origins in Spain back in the 1400s. Right. It's actually, uh, it actually came from an instrument called the Qatar, which was actually a Middle Eastern instrument introduced mm. into Spain during the Moorish occupation. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they came out of Africa? And they came out of Africa. Knowing that the oldest instruments discovered had been flutes and whistles in all places on the planet, um, I would hesitate to credit the colonizers for introducing 
specifically the wind instruments. Yeah, I would hesitate greatly, particularly because there are traditional Native American wind instruments that have little to do with the Western concepts of transverse flutes and uh, clarinets and what have you. You know, mm. with those things, a lot of them. I'm just talking off the top of my head here, but almost seem to have a, a, an ancestry in Indian instruments like the Shanai and, and things like that. Mm. Native American instruments are, are a lot more unique to them. I have a I have a trouble of sort of visualizing any kind of family lineage. You mm-hmm. know? And, and yeah, um, there's evidence of them long before long before um, the the Europeans arrived in the Americas. So you mm-hmm. know, there you have it. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the music itself to the to the degree that we, we can. Let me just say this: um, if you're going to try and re- research or Google or look up Native American music, for every one authentic recording, you get some. You get uh, about five hundred million <laughs> million <laughs> of these new age kind of meditation kind yeah, of new things. agey meditation. Somebody with you know the uh, the the. Somebody with a pan flute patch on their new keyboard. I, I'm <laughs> dating myself, yeah, but, 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 yeah. Uh, so you you do have to do a little bit of effort to get get authentic stuff. But there is definitely authentic stuff out there. There is, there is, and but here's another thing. There's they 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 can be really. Um, they're very serious about preserving some of their rituals and ceremony ceremonial music. Mm, there is so some stuff you're not going to get to see. You'll never hear <laughs> the microphones won't be in the room. When they're doing some of these things in the privacy of their own home or within right. their tribes, some right. are sacrosanct. Right, you know? right, yeah. So, for that reason, it's also harder to get an accurate picture, indeed, of the music. But in general, let's talk about it. the uh, the music is often repetitive, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. uh, and in a lot of ceremonies, they're doing this to induce a trance-like state, indeed, or to accommodate a trance-like state. Indeed, repetition is indicative of of trance-like states, in in Multiple cultures and multiple musical cultures, even in ours. Mm-hmm. By the way, go sure. listen to Philip Glass. Oh yeah, sure. You know the um, and the meter itself is typically pretty simple, grouped in twos or threes, mm-hmm. and it, it kind of needs to be to be repetitive enough to not be distracting. Yeah, I can. You can. You can groove along to a four four way more than you can to five four. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Or other complex patterns. Yeah, and and again, you know, meter is. Is again a European idea. Uh, uh, meter is how Europeans organized rhythm. Oh yeah. Um, uh, th- there's uh, you know Native American rhythm is something entirely different, where it's not necessarily organized into beats and pulses. Anyway, you know, um, there's there's one I uh, I'm going to butcher the name of this, but the Kinikia, something like that. <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry, apologies. I'm, I'm sure that was butchered. I'm not touching that one. Uh, but uh, it, it is an alternation of is an, the phrases are an alternation of seven syllables and eleven syllables. Oh, cool! So you count to seven, then you count to eleven, then you count to seven, then you count to eleven over the beat of a, a drum. So seven beats, eleven beats, seven beats, eleven beats. That's pretty uh, complex. That's that's very complex. It's just not metered, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's what the first, not only the first conquerors, but Westerners since since we got to this continent have, have have had a tendency to do is to go into Native American music like we've done all around the world and go well that's not a very complex meter you mm-hmm, know mm-hmm. you know and try to you know we'll four four it out and go okay well that's simple mm-hmm. which is really missing the point it's not really supposed to be organized yes it's going to sound simple you know yeah yeah um, it, it's kind of like saying I like both kinds of music country and western. You know, it's <laughs> why well, I'd say that the 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 lack of complexity of their music also suggests that it's not all about showmanship. <laughs> you know, it was mainly about you know. Yeah, had, we'll talk. We're about to talk about the purposes. In fact, indeed. But um, before we get into the purposes of these of these songs, um, is there anything else you want to say about the music itself? <laughs> because Fred was asking. He was about, asking. Yeah. Um, we talked about the melodies a little bit. About the melodies, uh, the the percussion, the the repeated phrases, mm-hmm. uh, the percussion. There, the really, I, I can't think of a Native American music that I've ever heard that doesn't have some kind of percussion, mm-hmm. um, e- even when it's all vocals. But I, I think, in primarily Native American music, I think it's safe to say is primarily vocals uh, and percussion mm-hmm. is, is the primary texture to, to, to most of it. There are, and there's not a lot of harmony. 
Right. Another right. another thing Westerners tend to do all around the world, Europeans and and their descendants tend to do all around the world is go around and say, well, you know, you've got this simplistic, you know, uh, backwards, you know, kind of hokey music in your culture because there's no harmony to it. Yes, it is not. Which is which is the height of complexity for for European music. It's right? unsophisticated because it's so yeah simple. Yeah. And it, it, it's simple in the way, you know, th this is kind of, this is kind of like, um, that's not me talking. No, they, yeah. Yeah. We're, we're paraphrasing yes. for, you know, uh, um, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of white people, narrow minded white people, <laughs> for a bunch of narrow minded <laughs> white people. Yeah. Um, uh, but it, it's kind of like, a, uh, what's that, uh, uh, what's that saying? Um, uh, climbing a tree is the easiest thing," said the squirrel to the fish. "Why can't you do it?" Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah. The the harmony reaches the height of complexity in in European culture, mm -hmm. but in in Asian cultures, it is melody that reaches the height of complexity. In in African cultures, it is rhythm that reaches the height of complexity. Right? Oh, nice. African cultures have rhythms that are so sophisticated they don't. Uh, we can't follow them as Westerners. It just it just sounds like. It sounds random because we can't follow the patterns. They're so complex. But they're, they're counting. They're doing, they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Uh, same with those Indians, some of those Indian drums. Mm -hmm. East, East Indian I'm talking about. Yeah. Know, crazy patterns. Yeah, from the subcontinent of India. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> interesting pattern and, and, and melodies, you know, that sound almost out of tune to us if we're, if we're being particularly ethnocentric. And, you know, it's because they have complexities of other kinds. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's my second soapbox of this episode, so now I'm really done. Oh, uh, that might be your third one, actually. <laughs> well, I'll go back and listen. <laughs> we'll go back. And... <laughs> we'll go back and listen. We'll go back and, and send a tallying count of Matt's hey, soapboxes. It's, use, it's useful information. <laughs> yeah. It's useful information. <clears throat> uh, so also we mentioned, like I said, the pentatonic, the tritonic scales. Uh, probably within microtones of those is what really has, is going probably on. Probably well, within microtones of those, yeah. Yeah. This is our way of trying to make sense of it, especially based on the theory we've given y'all so far. Right, yeah. Which what the hardest thing to do is is to take Western theory and try to uh, apply it to a different, you know. You start feeling like there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. And there's just a ton there. And it's just you, you've kind of got the wrong lens. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. So, okay. So we talked a little bit about the music and the instruments and the elements and everything. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the purpose, you know. Uh, yeah, let's get to the purpose. I got a great quote for you. You ready? Mm hmm Songs come from creation itself. Songs come from the earth. We are merely vessels through which it can flow and come forth and give joy and give culture and show us traditions. Singing is the communication with ancestors, and singing is also the sound that the wind produces when creating rustling sounds in the trees. When we sing, our ancestors sing, and the earth sings. That was from Whirling Cloud Woman of the Ute Tribe. Well, there you go. That's all you need to know about purpose, right? <laughs> Sums it up. <laughs> Summed it up very, very nicely. That is that is the purpose of their music right there. Isn't that beautiful? I certainly can't add anything to that. You know, many of these tribes believe that some of these songs were birthed at the time of creation by the creator and other spirit beings. Indeed. And uh, these works in many tribes would be considered complete or sacrosanct, you know, mm, yeah. and that no new music should come from them or be added to them. Yeah, this is this is kind of a common notion in a lot of cultures. Actually, the idea that that music is, yeah, the the, the music of that culture is originating with the creation of the universe. Number one, mm -hmm. and and number two, uh, uh, sacrosanct and and should not be touched. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have this in Western culture. You do not write a new Gregorian chant. Yeah, the Gregorian chants were assembled by Pope Gregory. They're there. They're what they are. They're saying. And Pope Gregory got these chants by sitting at his window, and a little bird came, and the little bird was God, and God sang them to him, and he wrote them down. If if you believe the doctrine, the lore, right? yeah, the lore, right? Which is not so. Which is a sort of the European version of that music origin story that comes up in in all, all kinds of cultures. Uh, inspired by God, ultimately. Inspired or, or by God. Whatever your version, whatever your idea of God yeah. might yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. Not a religious podcast, but yeah, they, but, there, but that is the lore. Yeah. yeah. Now, in other cases, a shaman or another tribe member might have a dream where a spirit brings them a new dance, a song, or, or ritual. In any case, these communities all seem to agree that music comes from beyond the individual and from beyond the community. Indeed. 
Yeah. So, and that it binds the community together mm -hmm. in, 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 um, in, in a very important way. So that's one good, good reason they do it mm -hmm. to, to, you know, bring the community together. Uh, these songs were also used to promote healing, you mm -hmm. know, to give thanks for a bountiful harvest, mm -hmm. you know, to prepare for battle and other things important to these cultures at Indeed. the time. Yeah. And the things they were dealing with. Um, now, as far as the ceremonial songs go, in many tribes, such as the Navajo tribe, ceremonial songs are privately done, like I said, within their tribe or within their home. Mm. Uh, in tribes such as the Apache, uh, the dances are not so much choreographed as they are informed by the words that the singer is singing. Oh, interesting. So some of these tribes, a lot of them actually have dances that they, they kind of make. They yeah, yeah. They choreograph. Right, yeah. But uh, not all tribes observe that, as we see. Yeah. So Apaches is kind of like an improv, you know yeah. what I mean? Improvised yeah. dancing, interpretive dancing, um, which I think is kind of cool. Another purpose of their music is that the native language lives on through their music. Yeah. For example, there are currently 245 indigenous languages in the United States. Mm. Uh, 65 of them have gotten extinct, and another 75 are nearing extinction. Mm. So the Navajo speakers are the largest population mm -hmm. of these uh, indigenous speakers, and that's uh, 170,000 people. That's not a lot. That's not a lot at all. So uh, most people on today's reservation speak English or what is called res. Right. Uh, I guess um, res is just kind of what you hear when you hear what is considered a Native American accent. Right, yeah. There's a certain kind of, there's a certain musicality to it. You know, there's a certain yeah. cadence to it. And I think you know it when you hear it, but that's still English. Yeah. One other thing I would say is that uh, their history lives on within their music. Mm -hmm. You know, each tribe tells stories of their ancestors through the music. Absolutely. But there are also more earthly topics such as love songs and so on. Yes. And, th and there's also sort of, there is the, um, there is the division between sacred and traditional music mm -hmm. uh, versus folk music. Which which will sound similar, but but um, you know it is less sacrosanct. Exactly. And, and then mo and then the modern popular versions. You know, th th this is again something. Th this, these divisions crop up in 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 lots of of cultures. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so like the 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 yay would be an example of sacrosanct music mm -hmm. uh, in the Navajo community. Okay. Uh, the the Yevakikai. Um, the uh, you know there's a uh, there, there are things like shizana a, uh, which would be folk music, um, where you know they're singing about this uh, this young brave who is drunk and is leaning against a house, and you know the the maiden comes up and says you know look at you you're so drunk and he says I'm I'm not drunk this house is about to fall over and I'm keeping it from doing so. <laughs> Sounds right? like an Irish an old Irish joke. Yeah, well yeah yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so so uh, you know things things like that. You know, is sort of the sort of folk, and 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 popular. And then there's the popular music. For example, um, uh, uh, country music has had a huge influence on these reservations, mm -hmm. right? The, mm -hmm. There's a there's an all Navajo country cover band that covers Johnny Cash. They're called the Fenders. The Vendors, huh? The Fenders. Yeah. The Fen even better. Even better, right? Yeah, and and yeah, the, uh, definitely check them out. They're pretty awesome. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about some more modern kind of Native American influence on some pop culture in just a little Excellent. bit. Excellent. But first, what else do we have to say about the uh, the songs themselves? Oh, the purposes, yes. Uh, we talked about how they have love songs and so on. Mm. In many cases, these love songs are sad songs, you know, songs of loss and departure. Mm -hmm. And they also have hiding game songs for recreation, mm -hmm. which are typically short in duration and limited on pitch variation. Right. Um, and then they had healing songs also in li limited range, but feature repetition of lower notes, mm -hmm. you know? And then the war songs had wider ranges, higher notes, and greater diversity in note duration. Mm. So a lot of these musical devices are used in other cultures for similar purposes. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yeah. I can think of other cultures that, that do the same. You know, the war songs, you know, I think of the, the Iwe people of Africa and their Ag Agbekor songs. You know, which start out as war songs, and then they become kind of metaphors for lots of other things. But, <laughs> but yeah, they they definitely have war songs. Um, there are definitely uh, healing songs in um, Mongolian music, uh, and and <coughs> well, the question would be, um, do they 
like with the healing songs in Mongolia and some other land like uh, Japan or mm. Australia or whatever, would they have similar characteristics? Similar musical characteristics? Like, yeah, like lower repetitive trancing kind if of. If I could observe and prove that, I would be a very rich and famous and oft published ethnomusicologist. Yes, you would, huh? <laughs> that, yeah, I mean, if I could ever land on, on that, boy, wow, my, my career would be. I, 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 you know, forget this music theory stuff. I, I would be, you know, I, I'd be super famous for that. Book publishing superstar. <laughs> yeah, really. It's a nice idea to think about. Uh, you know, maybe there's some, some burgeoning ethnomusicologists out there willing to, willing to take that on. Neil. To, Neil. Neil Mathern, Mathern. If you're listening. Yeah. Hey, uh. He doesn't do academia anymore, but. <laughs> he got out, huh? He, yeah, he, he, he got out. He escaped. Hey, let me just say this. I can't imagine any culture. Though there maybe there is one or two where a healing song would be fast and loud, you know. Mm, no. Get better, get better, get better, get better, get better. <laughs> can you imagine? No, I can imagine maybe trying to chase the spirit away or something. Oh, but, okay, okay. Yeah, you know, now we're getting somewhere. But I'm just spitballing. We're speculating. Know. Speculating. We're yeah, doing, we're doing a, bit, a good bit of that, and that's okay. We're exercising our brain muscles, our speculation muscles. <laughs> it's important. It's important. All right, so um. Let's have a little fun and talk about some influences on today's music. Okay. These are mainly things I've observed, you know. Mm, yeah. But there's a c- couple of good examples out there. Um, not a lot from the actual um, people themselves, but a, s- a lot of stuff that was inspired by their stories. Sure. You know. Paul Revere and the Raiders popularized this song called Indian Reservation. <laughs> and you know it if you heard it, right? It's the one that goes like, Cherokee people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. ba 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 Cherokee tribe. I remember that. And so on. Well, Marvin Carlton Rainwater, who first recorded this back in 1959, claims to be a one quarter blood Cherokee ancestry. Mm. But with a name like Rainwater, come on, that's 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 it's that's feasible. Possible, I suppose. Uh, but the song was actually written by a guy named John D. Loudermilk. So <laughs> I don't know where that sense is. Well, it seems less intuitive. <laughs> uh, what I like about it is the fact that they're telling the story. And, and the, the injustices that were done to these people. Yeah. And another similar um, crew that did this was uh, the band Europe. Right. You remember that song, The Final Countdown? Yeah. Right, yeah. It's re- re- recently kind of resurfaced in the past decade or so. Yeah. Um, they released the album, The Final Countdown, in 1986. And uh, there was a song called Cherokee on it. Mm. Do you remember that song at all? I do not. Cherokee, marching on the trail of tears. Yeah, I don't think I've ever heard same that. Same deal, kind of telling the yeah. same story. So people are kind of taking interest in this, of course. Yeah. Um, and, you know, actually, a quick thing about myself is I initially was going to be a keyboard player mm. because I heard that song, Final Countdown, and I got a guitar. I got my dad to give me a guitar for Christmas. And I was like, hey, it's not making those sounds. I told this story before. <laughs> It's okay. It's He's a like, good one. Because it's a keyboard. <laughs> uh, so anyways, Europe, thank you. Thank you, Europe. This might be why I'm I sitting suppose. here. <laughs> um, they also had a song called Ninja on the album. So to me, that was the coolest album ever. Ever. Yeah. Ninja's Cherokees. Yeah. Now moving on, we have Robbie Robertson, the guitarist and songwriter for the band. Yeah. You know, Cripple Creek and all that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, he was actually born of Mohawk descent via his mother. Nice. Uh, he grew up on a Six Nations reservation in Ontario, Canada, mm. and he addresses his, this ancestry on his uh, 1998 release, Contact from the Other World with Red Boy. Nice. And in uh, 1994, just previous to that, he recorded uh, with the Red Road Ensemble, mm-hmm. which is a Native American group, for the television soundtrack of Music for the Native Americans. Nice. And uh, one of the cooler ones I want to bring up and these people are actually of descent. Uh, Redbone. I was going to bring up Redbone if if you didn't get to it. All right, which 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 uh, what song is that, Matt? So that's "Come and Get Your Love." Yeah, which is an old seventies disco ish. Is it disco? Do you think? Or it's got that, this. Yeah. It's it's um. it could. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, and come and get your love. Yeah, yeah, come and get your love. Come and get your love. Come and get, get your love. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Beautiful. It's really groovy. Yeah, and written by an all Native American band. 
It was actually uh, brothers Pat and Lolly Vegas. Okay. And they formed this band back in 1969 mm -hmm. in California. And at the height of their success, you're right, all members of, were of Mexican-American and Native American heritage. Or Native American descent. Okay, okay. So um, uh, in 1974, they sold over a million copies yeah. of that hit single. There's also a great um, uh, recording out there of... Um, they were on some dance show or something, and they were and they were uh, giving a concert. But before "Come and Get Your Love," um, is the guitar player in the band, whoever he is, does uh, does sort of a um, quick replica of a of a Navajo dance, mm -hmm. right? And and before they uh, before he you know picks up his guitar, and 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 the the drums are kind of backing it up, and oh, there's a there's gosh. a chant that goes on. Yeah, I would have to see that. It's it's really amazing. Definitely go. You know, if you if you look up Redbone, you'll probably see it in one of the first few. It's like a live show, like a yeah. live live footage. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And um, uh, really interesting. You know, when I when I used to teach world music, I used to talk about this all the time about this this phenomenon of these cultures using what is now the universal musical language that is American popular music mm. to sort of say to the west of to sort of say to the rest of the world. This is kind of what our culture is like. Mm -hmm. So we're going to filter that through the, this filter of Western pop music. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do that so that everybody can understand it. Mm. Because at this point, Western popular music, American popular music, is kind of the universal language everybody's listening to. Uh, and, and in so doing, you know, we are going to um, you know, uh, present ourselves to the rest of the musical world. And you know, that's a kind of a great example of what, what Redbone does in that. Um, you know, it, it, it's you know, it, it's not the most authentic Native American thing you'll ever see, but oh, yeah, yeah. but it is it is an approximation designed to sort of give you a flavor of. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, uh, one other thing about Redbone is, um, <laughs> I told you I've been watching this show, uh, Reservation Dogs. Yeah. On Hulu. Yes. It's actually written and directed by Native Americans, mm. and it gives kind of an accurate um, portrayal for the most part of what it's like to, on reservation life. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of funny. There's this kind of main police officer that drives around. He had one of the kids in his car with him, and he's playing the Redbone song. He's like, what? You don't know this? You need to study your people. You know? <laughs> That's a great show, by the way, if you want to. I will, I will you, check that out. Well, another thing I kind of, that, assuming it is an accurate portrayal, which I'm, according to what I read it is, yep. they have the moments where, like, one of these kids, these kids are kind of like just little kind of, Teenagers, you know, yep. troublemakers mm -hmm. and whatnot. Right. But if they walk into a house and someone's burning sage, they kind of wave it onto themselves. Yeah. Um, and they know they they also participate in rituals and sing the songs of their native people as well. I, when I, it's I time want, to get serious, I want to definitely look watch that show. Only other thing I'll say about Redbone is surviving the death of his brother Lolly in 2010. Pat still leads the band, mm. so y'all can still see Redbone. Excellent. Hopefully. Maybe Excellent. they'll be touring. Who knows? <laughs> okay, now there's one more thing I want to talk about here, Matt. Okay. Before we get out of here, and mm -hmm. it's um, cool, but also kind of annoying. Mm. Like I said, <laughs> there was this album called Pure Moods back in 1997. Do you remember that at all? Yes. It was all over the infomercials. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, because I get get you know this is a CD of, of Pure Moods, and it was just like they called it mood music. Yeah. New age kind of meditation. New music. agey meditation y kind of, yeah. It wasn't the, the soundtrack to the X Files on that. It absolutely mm. was. Yeah. Tubular Bells. Tubular Bells. Is, yeah, yeah. Uh, Audimus. I tubular Bells. Yeah. Audimus. Na, 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 Yeah, I think Enya might have had a song on it. Sail Away. Sail Away. Or, yeah, that you got, yeah, yeah. This is how well we remember this. I haven't seen this, this infomercial in like 30 in forever, years. Forever, but as soon as you said Tubular Bells, it all comes rushing back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Good luck getting old, young people. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But one of the tracks on this album is uh, Sacred Spirit, the the uh, the, uh, the group Sacred Spirit doing uh, Yea Noah. Okay. Which is Wishes of Happiness and Prosperity, and uh, it's sung in the Navajo language. Nice. So when you listen to it, don't be looking for anything authentic as far as the music goes, <laughs> but the actual... The, the, the words, the, at least. The words and the melody he's singing are, are Navajo tradition. Nice. And I assume it is an open social kind of thing you can sing about. I, 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 if they're singing about it, I would presume. So, yeah, man. That's what they, we know right now. There, there you have it. Yeah. I, I've already kind of committed to the idea of doing a part two. 
<laughs> of this of this um because there's just so much to say i really wanted to actually get into the regions a little bit more yeah, yeah. and where the influences came we talked a little bit about the inuits in alaska and then mexican the Mayans right, right. yeah, and yeah. the pueblos in the united states and uh of course we haven't even touched south america yet so uh it would be cool to get a bit a bit more of a picture of yeah, the South, South America is kind of a different meta culture, right? Right, that's a whole yeah. different thing. Yeah, um, yeah. So genres, man. Yeah, genres. Pretty excited about it, and this makes me excited to like do do some African cultures at some point too. And absolutely, maybe we should have started with that since maybe it seems we, like eh, it's fine. That's where everything started with. So before we get out of here, I would like to acknowledge some sources that I was able to use uh, to put this information together for you, good listeners. Uh, Britannica.com, that's always a great one. Yep. Um, there's uh, two articles by Victoria Lindsay Levine, mm -hmm. and those are Native American Music History and Native American Music. Mm. Uh, SmithsonianMag.com, uh, this was uh, Ancient DNA Charts, Native American Journeys to Asia Thousands of Years Ago. And I guess that was a staff, editorial mm. staff article. Yeah. Um, and then we had um, Ticini Drums. Dot com, mm. where there's an article called Understanding the History Behind Native American Drums by Tatini Drums. And finally, we have the Library of Congress blogs. Uh, the article was Appreciating Native American Music by Juliet Uphold. Mm. And of course, we always have good old Wikipedia. Yeah, and we have good old Wikipedia. And I might as well go ahead and add... Um a, a secondary source that I used in, in my world music class a lot, which mm -hmm. is uh, Worlds of Music. Uh-huh. A textbook edited by Jeff Titan. Oh, nice. Okay. Very good. I might have to look into that one for the next episode. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. We're going to go ahead and close out uh, with another authentic recording. Indeed. Can't wait. This is the Eagle Song by a Hopi tribe out of Arizona, recorded on Wax Cylinder in 1906 by Otto Abraham. Excellent. We'll see y'all next time. 